All right, cool. So let's finish up Gender Troll. Uh, and as I kind of said in the little description, if anyone actually read that, uh, I didn't discuss performativity in the last, uh, the first episode, the first half, because Butler only mentions it so briefly that it felt unnecessary because it comes to play a bigger part toward the end. Um, and then I decided that maybe that was wrong, and I should present the little bit that she does talk about it. So, performativity. Now, to kind of recap, we know that gender comes about via various uh, regulative phenomena, comes comes in through the various like um, uh, power relations, through the law, through justice, through the judicial system, judicial system, through all these things, gender kind of comes about, almost like a direct intervention by a source of power by an authority. Now, how does it become naturalized? Well, quite simply, through its repetition. So if it is constantly being uh, told and retold or performed, then it comes to, it, it, yeah, I will just say it again, it becomes naturalized. It becomes the only option, the only way we know how to live. So with this being said, it would be wrong for us to think as though gender is something that can simply be taken off or, you know, new ones can simply be inputted. Butler wants to caution against that because she wants to highlight the fact that these regimes of power, these regimens of power, are powerful. They have the effect of naturalizing these various gender phenomena and then by virtue of that, make them almost solid. They kind of galvanize them. So gender does, in that sense, become true. It is something that we internalize wholly. And by virtue of that, it's not something we can simply strip off so easily. So she comes to really uh, develop this idea toward the end or kind of highlight the potential behind it at the, at the end of the text. Uh, but for now, earlier on in the book, she gives us a better idea of what she means by performativity. And this is on 34 of my copy. So, in this sense, gender is not a noun, but neither is it a set of free-floating attributes, for we have seen that the substantive effect of gender is performatively produced and compelled by the regulatory practices of gender coherence. Hence, within the inherited discourse of the metaphysics of substance, gender proves to be performative, that is, constituting the identity it is purported to be. In this sense, gender is always a doing, though not doing by a subject who might be said to pre-exist the deed. The challenge for rethinking gender categories outside of the metaphysics of substance will have to consider the relevance of Nietzsche's claim in On the Genealogy of Morals, which I've done here, so if you want to listen to that, uh, that there is no being behind doing, affecting, becoming. The doer is merely a fiction added to the deed. The deed is everything. In an application that Nietzsche himself would not have anticipated or condoned, we might state as a corollary. There is no gender identity behind the expressions of gender. That identity is performatively constituted by the very expressions that are said to be its results. So this is an idea I kind of worked out a bit in the last um, episode, notably that gender comes to affirm or kind of retroactively affirm the natural attributes associated with gender, which then come to um, affirm and justify, validate the existence of gender itself. So, you know, various, um, you know, things come to be infected by this, like science, for instance. So if we live in a certain paradigm, the one that um, Butler is describing here, for instance, where we have heter compulsory heterosexuality, then that, for at least Butler, comes to infect all the ways that we might look at the world. So, take science, for instance, or take history, all our kinds of expeditions into the past or into the scientific world or in that, in the natural world is then kind of glazed over by this lens. So this is why we can get certain uh, clowns on the internet saying things like, you know, men are naturally attracted to red lipstick because we can see X, Y, and Z attributes in nature. And it, 
you know, it's quite embarrassing, really, because you only need to watch five minutes of any of these, you know, Netflix, the planet Earth or planet things to see that this type of um, performance that is so often ascribed to women in the act of wearing red lipstick uh, is taken on by, quote unquote, male uh, animals and all of these different species as well, troubling the idea that it is reserved solely for men. However, or not really however, many of these people, when they, you know, try to justify their oppressive claims or try to generate uh, this broad overreaching narrative of, you know, gender relations, use nature to justify their arguments. So they look to the natural world, for instance. But just with the example that I just gave, um, it's a very selective approach to nature. So they begin with an axiom, and that axiom is that gender relations exist and that the, we have two genders, and then jump to any kind of given, you know, species paradigm and say, look, we can see the same thing here, therefore it is real. Not knowing that that is, it's, it's a non sequitur, it doesn't make, you know, logical sense, because if we assume that animals represent the natural world, then we should expect to see these same attributes exist across all animals. Now, we only have to think about Darwin for a moment to actually know that the theory of evolution totally throws all of these supposed natural universal attributes out of whack. Because people change in relation to their environment. People change in relation to their, you know, their settings, quite simply. And that was a bit of a digression. Anyways, performativity is the act of doing gender through time that comes to naturalize gender, comes to normalize it. So then, okay, let's get into the third. Ugh, let's get into the third chapter then to work toward the end. Okay, so this chapter titled "Subversive Bodily Acts" is gonna repeat some of the things that have come up before. So, um, th th for those that haven't read this book, it's kind of repetitive, and there are various ideas that reemerge. Um, so for that reason, I try to sketch like a kind of a coherent narrative through it that doesn't repeat too much, because that would be boring. Uh, but with that being said, it's hard sometimes to avoid bringing things up because although the general idea is the exact same, uh, Butler will apply it to various different things. So I'll tr I try to kind of parse through those to really pick out the important ones, but the best antidote to this is to actually go and read the book. So there. So Butler begins this chapter by retelling the kind of broad Lacanian argument. Notably, we have a pre-symbolic, so a pre-language system, and then we have a symbolic one, so a language system. So in the pre-symbolic, that is characterized or associated with the feminine, because that is associated with the chaotic, with the multiplicitous, with the possible, if you'd say. Whereas the symbolic is associated with univocality, so a kind of singularity, uh, and order, which is so often associated with the masculine, which is already, you know, pretty problematic. But there are some feminists, as we have saw in the previous episode, that take this up in a very um, positive way, suggesting that Lacan is breaking down the boundaries of, um, you know, biological determinism, suggesting that these things come about through culture to some extent, which is, a, you know, I guess it's, at the time was a pretty radical proposition. I don't really know, but... But now we get a new person here, and that is Julie Kristeva or sorry, Julia Kristeva, I don't know why I said that, uh, Julia Kristeva, who takes on Lacan. So Kristeva says that Lacan creates too neat of a break between the pre-symbolic and the symbolic, or between the masculine and the feminine. For Kristeva, she wants to locate the ways in which our culture um, demonstrates examples of the pre-symbolic, so almost like a relic of the past. And Kristeva gives an example like poetry. So poetry being a way to smash the order associated with the symbolic. So Kristeva does then associate this kind of possibility as demonstrated through poetry with uh, the feminine or with maternality. So Butler takes issue with this as she does throughout the course of this text, you know, pointing to the limits of so many thinkers um, approaches where Butler suggests that even Kristeva 
gives yourself over too quickly or kind of naively to a gender paradigm that is always already oppressive. Now, what does that mean? Well, when Kristeva says that the poetic or poetry has the potential to smash the symbolic order, what Butler reads in that is a romanticization of this idea of the feminine, which simply reinvigorates the sense of feminine equaling, you know, multiplicity or chaos or stuff like that, which is for Butler a simply reinscription of the same dichotomous gender paradigm that Butler's trying to get away from or that where Butler sees a true radicality lying. So whereas, or while Kristeva presents something that is a, I guess, you know, a really radical and potentially um, beneficial project, Butler is suggesting that we kind of pump the brakes a little bit and see what is going on underneath her, you know, discourse, underneath her rhetoric that reinscribes the same system. Now, Kristeva goes further than this, than simply to suggest that poetry breaks apart the symbolic by suggesting that poetry is a kind of return to a matern maternality or a maternity, I guess. So as Butler writes on 113 to 114, she writes that in Motherhood According to Bellini, one of Christeva's texts, Christeva suggests that because the maternal body signifies the loss of coherent and discrete identity, poetic language verges on psychosis. And in the case of women's semiotic expressions in language, the return to the maternal signifies a pre-discursive homosexuality that Kristeva also associates with psychosis. Although Kristeva concedes that poetic language is sustained culturally through its participation in the symbolic and, hence, in the norms of linguistic communicability, she fails to allow that homosexuality is capable of the same non-psychotic psychotic social expression. The key to Kristeva's view of the psychotic nature of homosexuality is to be understood, I would suggest, in her acceptance of the structuralist assumption that heterosexuality is coextensive with the founding of the symbolic. Hence the cathexis, the kind of sublimation, of homosexual desire can be achieved, according to Kristeva, only through displacements that are sanctioned within the symbolic, such as poetic language or the act of giving birth. So what Kristeva is doing here, at least according to Butler, is trying to construct or to highlight the ways that various um, resistive potentials can be realized within the symbolic, so within culture, within the law. So what that does for Butler, it doesn't present a radical alternative to the system. Rather, it affirms it in, to much in, to some extent, because it still posits the fundamental distinction between the symbolic and be between the chaotic or the semiotic, as uh, Butler also or or Kristeva uses the term. So the semiotic is also associated with the pre-symbolic, associated with the feminine, associated with the chaotic, and of course there is the problematic association of psychosis with homosexuality, where Butler writes. And hence, according to Kristeva, female homosexuality is the emergence of psychosis into culture. And that this homosexuality is made manifest in poetry and in the act of giving birth. You know, two things so often associated with femininity that it's, it's almost embarrassing like that to submit, you know, one's own project to that and to pretend that that's a, you know, a radical project. But this critique keeps going. So for Butler... We think about things in a totalizing way. So we think of things in terms of the, kind of like the panopticon, where you can't get outside of it. The idea is that there is a, a regulatory mechanism that operates on everybody. So for Chris David to suggest that there are these types of zones that break, that, break down that system, what she's effectively doing is constructing the idea that there is an outside to the power relations in which we live. So for Butler, that presents a problem because that for her is impossible. You can't live outside of it. So the only way that Kristeva's project actually has any merit is in its impossibility. So it constructs a fantasy, that is. It constructs an idea that cannot be realized. So for Butler, 
she just kind of shrugs her shoulders and says, so what? You know, you're, t- you're giving us this roadmap that leads nowhere or this roadmap of, you know, never, never land that we can't get to. Sure, it looks nice. It looks like a great place to visit, but I don't know how to get there. Or in Butler's words, Kristeva appears to foreclose the possibility of subversion as an effective or realizable cultural practice. Uh, by relegating the source of subversion to a site outside of culture itself. So what is more, by framing the poetic as a kind of heterogeneous possibility, and by foreclosing it in the domain of the feminine, what it effectively does, as I think I've made clear, is it reinscribes the idea of the, the gender binary, where men associated with the law, women associated, or the feminine associated with the chaotic, so all that does for Butler is simply reinscribe that system instead of breaking down the law of, you know, the masculine, you know. And the, the question is, well, how does she actually do that? And that comes out toward the end. Butler gives her own um, her own spiel. Or as was kind of presented in the first uh, half, for her, it really comes down to repeating, to performing almost the same kinds of, absurd gender identities that we hold on so dearly in subversive ways, what she comes to call parody. So now let's move away from Kristeva to look at Foucault in more detail, who Butler, you know, is indebted to, makes great use of him, but is also very critical of him. So as she says of him on 127, when we consider, however, those textual occasions on which Foucault criticizes the categories of sex and the power regime of sexuality, it is clear that his own theory maintains an unacknowledged emancipatory ideal that proves increasingly difficult to maintain, even within the strictures of his own critical apparatus. So this is a problem found in Foucault, according to Butler, that she'll come to unravel. But for now, she also gives him some, you know, tries to contextualize his project you know, to situate the reader within her understanding of his work. So she says, uh, in opposition to this false construction of sex as both univocal and casual, Foucault engages in a reverse discourse, which treats sex as an effect rather than an origin, in the place of sex as the original and continuous cause and signification of bodily pleasures, he proposes sexuality as an open and complex historical system of discourse and power that produces the misnomer of sex as part of a strategy to conceal and hence to perpetuate power relations. So this is very much in line with what Butler was saying in the first half and all throughout the, the book, uh, that sexuality is something that emerges in order to kind of pay credence or to justify its existence through the creation of sex. Now, this relates to that um, sex-gender bifurcation, where sex is assumed to be natural and gender is assumed to be kind of a construct. So what Butler wants to do is say, in fact, they're both constructs. This idea that sex has some kind of uh, natural status that stands above gender is entirely wrong. And it's our task then to under, to see the ways in which gender might actually come first. So gender arriving on the scene, various certain historical circumstances, be it the church, be it the monarch, be it whatever, then comes to impose its um, ideals onto the body, suggesting that these ideals are natural because of X, Y, and Z things found on the body. So according to Butler, Foucault is too optimistic in the history of sexuality. So for her, she sees Foucault in uh, as constructing a possibility that isn't there, a kind of emancipatory possibility that isn't there. So I don't have Foucault right in front of me, but I'm going to try uh, remember the last line of the first volume of the history of sexuality, where he says that our task, this isn't verbatim, but he says our task is should be to focus on bodies and pleasure and not on sex and sexuality, I believe, is what he says, which is kind of a radical project. So by suggesting that, he's suggesting that there's a way to strip off, you know, the um, imposition of sex and sexuality by various power relations to get to the kind of true body underneath. So for Butler, 
These are pleasures that clearly transcend the regulation imposed upon them. And here we see Foucault's sentiment, sentimental indulgence in the very emancipatory discourse his anal analysis in the history of sexuality was meant to displace. According to the Foucauldian model of emancipatory sexual politics, the overthrow of sex results in the release of a primary sexual multiplicity, a notion not so far afield from the psychoanalytic postulation of primary polymorphosis, polymorphousness, which is still often associated with the idea of the feminine. So then Butler continues, and this is on 131 in my version. Um, Foucault invokes a trope of pre-discursive libidinal multiplicity that effectively presupposes a sexuality before the law. Indeed, a sexuality waiting for emancipation from the shackles of sex, or in Foucault's terms, that, that idea of bodies and pleasure, which ascribes an, a certain meaning to bodies that supposedly it comes before the imposition of, you know, the law or power or anything like that. So Butler's critique of Foucault doesn't end there. She takes him to task on his uh, theorization of Herculean, which I'll give Butler's plot summary of here in length. So it's kind of long, but bear with me. This is on 132. So the journals of Herculean provide the opportunity to read Foucault against himself, or perhaps more appropriately, to expose the constitutive contradiction of this kind of anti-emancipatory call for sexual freedom. Herculean, called Alexina throughout the text, narrates a story about her tragic plight as one who lives a life of unjust victimization, deceit, longing, and inevitable dissatisfaction. So what Butler does here, and I'm sorry, um, is when she writes her, or um, she puts a... Um, a dash or a um, forward slash through the word, either she or her, to denote, to connote uh, a split. So it could be either she or he, right? Kind of instead of using the word them, using the ambiguous she or her with a slash through it. Yeah, I'll reread that sentence. So Herculean called Alexina throughout the text narrates a story about her tragic plight as one who lives a life of unjust victimization, deceit, longing, and inevitable dissatisfaction. So from the time that she or he was a young girl, she or he reports that she or he was different from the other girls. This difference is a cause for alternating states of anxiety and self-importance throughout the story. But it is there as tacit knowledge before the law becomes an explicit actor in the story. Although Herculean does not report directly on her or his anatomy in the journals, the medical reports that Foucault publishes along with Herculean's own text suggest that Herculean might reasonably be said to have what is considered as either a small penis or an enlarged clitoris. That where one might expect to find a vagina, one finds a cul-de-sac, as the doctors put it, and, further, that she doesn't appear to have identifiably female breasts. There seems also to be some capacity for ejaculation that is not fully accounted for within the medical documents. Herculean never refers to anatomy as such, but relates his or her predicament in terms of a natural mistake, a metaphysical homelessness, a state of insatiable desire, and a radical solitariness that, before his or her suicide, is transformed into a full-blown rage first directed toward men, but finally toward the world as such. So what's the problem with this? Well, as Butler, I think, correctly identifies, and I haven't read this thing that like Foucault was writing about this. I don't think I have, at least. Um, so for Butler, one could argue that prior to the legal transformation of a Alexina into a man, she or he was free to enjoy those pleasures that are effectively free of the juridical and regulatory pressures of the category of sex. Indeed, Foucault appears to think that the journals provide insight into precisely that unregulated field of pleasure prior to the imposition of the law and univocal sex. So Foucault takes Herculean as an example of that possibility, the kind of multiplicitous possibility of a pleasure before sexuality, of a pleasure before sex as it is ascribed to kind of naturalness through various power relations. But we can't forget that Herculean eventually does commit suicide. So this any kind of optimism associated with Herculean's being is surely undercut by this tragic end. And it presents like um, a limit to the, to the 
uh, thesis that Herculean was a kind of emancip emancipated, you know, before the law uh, being. So instead, Butler kind of associates a similar uh, potential behind Herculean's being, but not in the same way. So for Butler, she says that the language of usurpation, or the language of challenger, challenging authority, suggests participation in the very categories from which she or he feels inevitably distance, distance suggesting that also the denaturalized and fluid, fluid possibilities of such categories, once they are no longer linked causally or expressly to the presumed fixity of sex. Herculean's anatomy does not fall outside the categories of sex, as Foucault might be wont to think, but confuses and redistributes the constitutive elements of those categories. Indeed, the free play of attributes has the effect of exposing the illusory character of sex as an abiding substantive substrate to which these various attributes are assumed to adhere. Moreover, she continues, Herculean sexuality constitutes a set of gender transgressions which challenge the very distinction between heterosexual and lesbian erotic exchange. So the radicality behind uh, Herculean's existence is not in her being existing outside the system, presenting a kind of pre-libidinal, uh, you know, pleasurable possibility as Foucault or Butler reads in Foucault. Rather, it is the very way in which Herculean exists in the system that she is assumed to be outside of. And by virtue of being within that system and being, you know, pummeled by these, you know, authoritative figures like the law, she disturbs the idea that gender is smoothly associated with a sex and disturbs the idea that there is, you know, just two sexes. And it disturbs the idea that these things are natural or, or uh, universal. So according to Foucault, according to Butler, when Foucault writes that Herculean, in being able to uh, exist as both homosexual or heterosexual, sexual, um, specifically more so homosexual because she lives in a convent with other women and is able to engage sexually with these women, um, Foucault says that that is what constitutes her non-identity, her being outside of the system. So for Butler, that presents a problem because what that does is it reinforces the idea that homosexuality is a place of non-identity. It's unintelligible to the heterosexual matrix, which Butler, you know, is is kind of like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, of course, people are intelligible within this framework. In fact, uh, homosexual body, bodies are more intelligible because they're the ones that are regulated. They're the ones that are, you know, shunned away uh, in very precise, calculated ways. It is heterosexuality that is a place almost of non-identity because it, it's allowed to disappear into the folds of the system. So Foucault then, for Butler, simply um, participates in that sort of regulation of homosexual bodies as being a site of unintelligibility, a site of, you know, ambivalence. All right, so then Butler gives us um, a kind of peek into the scientific community, specifically one study done in the late 80s, 87, I believe, uh, done by a Dr. Page, the discovery of a master gene. So as Butler writes of this study, so this uh, occurred at MIT in 87, and it was um, the study that claimed to have discovered the secret and certain determinant of sex, that is the master gene. So with the use of highly sophisticated technological means, the master gene, which constitutes a specific DNA sequence on the Y chromosome, chromosome was discovered by Dr. David Page and his colleagues and named TDF, or Testes Determining Factor. In the publication of his findings in cell number 51, Dr. Page claimed to have discovered the binary switch upon which hinges all sexually dimorphic characteristics. So dimorphic being two, like men and women. Uh, to... Let us then consider the claims of this discovery and see why the unsettling questions regarding the decidability of sex continue to be asked. So to kind of preface this, we can... Keep, keep in mind what I said earlier about these YouTube clowns that impose their, you know, um, ideological understandings onto science or onto nature to justify their claims. So the first kind of problem that Butler points out, and she kind of does this in passing, is that the sample size was pretty limited. So that that's a problem. But what she also points out is that the, the study failed to consider 
the good 10% of the population that has chromosomal variations that do not fit neatly into the XX female and XY male set of categories. Which is a huge number of people. Like, that's a, a category in itself, perhaps. Uh, not to say that that's a, just one homogenous category, but certainly troubles the idea of the two, you know, split, where how many people is that in the United States? 35 million? So, like, anyways... So Butler continues to critique this uh, project by saying that unfortunately for Page, there was one persistent problem that haunted the claims made on behalf of the discovery of the DNA sequence. Exactly the same stretch of DNA said to determine maleness, in fact, found to be present on the X chromosome of females. Page first responded to this curious discovery by claiming that perhaps it was not the presence of the gene sequence in males versus its absence in females that was determining but that it was active in males and passive in females, which is like, what a convenient way to do away with this finding, you know, a finding that disturbs your very, like this isn't science, right? Science is supposed to put forward a hypothesis, do the study, see if it's falsifiable, and then if it's falsifiable, change the hypothesis. Whereas what the, the, this clown is doing was put forward a hypothesis, notably that there is differences between men and women, and those differences can be located in their DNA. And then when you find something that con contradicts you, you change what your finding suggests, not your hypothesis, which is wrong, which is wrong, wrong, wrong. And then in another funny way, Butler says that, you know, if we pay such um, credence to genitalia as being a determinant of sex, she asks, why was this study necessary at all? Why is it that we need to do these types of studies if we're so positive that sex determines gender? Or that, you know, there are these natural chromosomal attributes found in all people? You know, just another aside that she presents. But even the way that Dr. Page um, put forward this change within the, the findings, that is, that the female or the X chromosome is associated with, or the female chromosome is associated with absence, or passiveness, and the male one is associated with presence and activeness, is wholly gendered, and that derives entirely from an ideological paradigm, not a natural one. There's nothing in nature to suggest that, but it comes from an ideological paradigm that imposes itself onto science. But because science in our culture is housed with a kind of transcendent meaning, then it comes to affirm those ideas about gender that created that very narrative in the first place. So you have gender screwing up science, and I don't, you know, I'm not a, one of those people that says science is all useless or that science doesn't have certain like a validity behind it, but I think we have to be very careful with how this science is conducted. Uh, so we have uh, ideology essentially skew science change it in order to fit a narrative and then because science is associated with a kind of transcendent meaning or a, a valid meaning it then reinscribes the very gender ideology that cr that created it so they kind of work in a circle in order to affirm one another so then from there butler for some reason presents the quarrel between wittig and de beauvoir which is pretty much the same as from the first half. So I'm just I skip, I'm gonna skip it because if you listen to the first one, you know, the same thing is said there. So, but I will say that to kind of summarize it to bring us back into where it gets original, um, uh, Butler reads in Wittig and, and mostly Wittig the idea that there must be a kind of explosion of sex. So taking from Deleuze and Guattari, uh, Wittig believes in the idea that there are not there's not one or two sexes but you know infinite number of sexes so if there's a sex for every individual that would surely explode the whole paradigm of sex itself uh which is you know butler's like yeah okay fine cool but 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 that still commits too heavily to the idea of promoting sex promoting it as being like a thing that must be exploded or expanded because for butler Wittig's whole possibility hinges on lesbianism. So lesbianism being the thing that will explode these categories. So for 
Butler, in a self-consciously defiant imperialist strategy, Wittig argues that only by taking up the universal and absolute point of view, effectively lesbianizing the entire world, can the compulsory order of sexuality be destroyed. So what this does for uh, Butler is once again bifurcate it splits homosexuality homosexuality and heterosexuality that just feeds in the same system of binary production that put us in this problem in the first place so butler gives her response in a very concise way i find so she says on 165 my own conviction is that the radical disjunction posited by vidic between heterosexuality and homosexuality is simply not true that there are structures of psychic homosexuality within heterosexual relations and structures of psychic heterosexuality within gay and lesbian sexuality in relationships. Further, there are other power discourse centers that construct and structure both gay and straight sexuality. Heterosexuality is not the only compulsory display of power that informs sexuality. So what she's doing here is, you know, suggesting that, that you know, homosexuality and heterosexuality do not oppose each other in fact they are very much predicated on one another because the system relies because it's a system of binary constructions it is a system that relies it becomes stable under dual forms and i'm that's me taking from baudrillard not my idea but it becomes stable with a dual form and butler echoes this sentiment earlier in the book too that heterosexuality is a very um is a strong force because it relies on these kind of two uh, possibilities. So this is why, you know, the American political system is so messed up, yet so rejuvenating, self-rejuvenating, uh, is that it, you know, you have these two options. Where if you don't like one, you go to the other. It's the illusion of choice, the illusion of possibility. So for Butler, it's not about us getting outside the system or, or imagining a kind of radical alternative. Instead, she says quite simply, the terms queens, butch, butches, femmes, girls, even the parodic reappropriation of dyke, queer, and fag, redeploy and destabilize the categories of sex and the originally, originally derogatory categories of homosexual identity. So from this, Butler wants to propose a kind of reversal, not to suggest that it's not as though um, queer identities are derivative of heterosexual identities or cis heterosexual identities, but that... Um, heterosexual cis identities are derivative of queer ones. And she sees a radicality in this kind of reversal because it destabilizes the whole system of naturality that has ascribed such a heavy status or a high status in this paradigm. So for Butler, when we see, or when there are various categories like butch or, or butches or femmes, these simply do not reinscribe the system as some people might be want to think like Wittig, for instance. Uh, instead, Butler says that they very much disturb the system because they disturb this association with a neat kind of naturalness. So for her, within lesbian context, the identification with masculinity that appears as butch identity is not a simple assimilation of lesbianism back into the terms of heterosexuality. But I should say here that it would be wrong to romanticize these kinds of identities or the kinds of relations that emerge in these various different fields because they too can be oppressive so it's not as though like all butch relationships or all lesbian relationships or all any kind of queer relationship is um you know innately a good one like of course oppression can still seep into that and it would be wrong to say that all we must do is you know create this break with our heterosexual matrix into this new possibility, or not, not new, but into this other field, then all things will be good. You know, we always have to be cautious of the ways that that same kind of oppression might sneak in. Or one of the ways that Butler uh, says is that we should be cautious not to then make, like, as in the case of Wittig, to just um, supplant or replace the compulsory heterosexuality with a kind of compulsory homosexuality, because that won't get us anywhere. The point is to break down these kind of compulsory systems in order to open up possibility but a possibility predicated on the dissolution of this kind of naturalist paradigm but butler entertains this idea a little more to suggest that today in this world or in the western kind of context um, lesbianism is only kind of created as being a, a derivative of uh, heterosexuality so unless the heterosexual matrix is taken over 
a kind of intensification of lesbianism won't do anything. All it will do is result in, is in an equivalent intensification of the heterosexual paradigm. So, in her words, on 174, such an exclusion paradoxically institutes precisely the relation of radical dependency it seeks to overcome. Lesbianism would then require heterosexuality. Lesbianism that defines itself in radi radical exclusion from heterosexuality deprives itself of the capacity to resignify the heterosexual constructs by which is, it is partially and inevitably constituted. As a result, that lesbian strategy would consolidate compulsory heterosexuality in its oppressive forms. So you can't simply split the two apart. They are always going to be together because they were born together. And for that reason, the only way is, you know, to take it out from the inside. So what does resistance kind of look like? Because I've been vague so far. Well, for Butler, things like drag are site of resistance. Now, uh, many feminists have taken issue with this, which is correct. And even Butler has, I believe, since come to say that she, you know, she doesn't still espouse these views. Because it places a kind of emphasis on drag that doesn't is not innately there right like sure you know armchair philosophers can think about the ways that it is resistive but for many of the people that are you know that engage in that you know they do it because they what like it is a way for them to survive or to feel part of a community that is theirs that is not going to be judgmental that is not going to be restrictive so it's not about this greater political project it is simply about being which is you know, it's wrong to kind of co-opt that for a revolutionary end. So that's got that. Say that because that's that's important, I think. And of course, other feminists have said it better than than my dumbass. But you know, that's kind of jest, I think. So in Butler's words, she says that I would suggest as well that drag fully subverts the distinction between inner and outer psychic space and effectively mocks both the expressive model of gender and the notion of a true gender identity. So for, she continues, the notion of an original or primary gender identity is often parodied within the cultural practices of drag, cross-dressing, and the sexual stylization of butch and femme identities. So then that propels us into the conclusion, which is just a few pages here, the, where she emphasizes the way that parody, and parody done through drag, through you know these butch and femme identities, disturbs the primacy of a certain gender identity or framework. So for Butler, this project must go so deep as to even trouble the idea of the self. It must get into the bedrock of what makes the subject possible to reveal that the creation, that the subject is a creation, that the, that the I, like the letter I, for the self is wrong. So clearly on 197, identities can appear as so many inert substantives, substantives, substantives whatever. Indeed, epistemological models tend to take this appearance as their point of theoretical departure. However, the sub substantive I only appears as such through a signifying practice that seeks to conceal its own workings and to naturalize its effects. And as she made clear in the first half, uh, the I, or the self, is a product of the heterosexual matrix in which we live because one cannot dissociate their experiences of themselves from the gender identity in which they were propelled. So it's for Butler, as she makes clear in the first half, that by disturbing, disturbing, disturbing gender identities, will it will follow that we will see a disturbance of the self itself. So then we get the kind of concluding remark here, the kind of, you know, the climax. So the critical task is, rather, to subvert local, uh, sorry, the critical task is to locate strategies of subversive repetition enabled by those cons constructions to affirm the local possibilities of intervention through participating in precisely those practices of repetition that constitute identity and therefore present the imminent possibility of contesting them. So these things, you know, it isn't a, to a revolutionary kind of proletarian uh, overthrow. Like this happens in, in, local settings because that's all one can do is try to you know change their immediate environment 
to go further than that is to not only risk imposing your beliefs onto another, especially when we consider the way that feminism is different across uh, different paradigms across across the globe, but it's also just it be, starts to become a dream where if we set our sights too big, then you know nothing will get done because then we aren't satisfied unless you know the entire system changes, which doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but to also look at things as or uh, seeking victories on a much smaller scale, and I think that that can be you know quite good you know for one's uh, you know state of mind to see possibility as actually being possible. But then we get a word of caution from Butler, where she says that the task here is not to celebrate each and every new possibility qua possibility, but to redescribe those possibilities that already exist, but which exist within cultural domains designated as culturally unintelligible and impossible. So those identities that, um, or those possibilities that exist within the system, but aren't believed to, right? You know, they're the ones that have to be go through shock therapy and have to be institutionalized and so on and so forth. But yeah, I don't know what the state of that would be like today um, because we'd have to question whether or not certain possibilities, the ones that Butler privileges, the ones that already exist, only exist because of various, you know, power relations and perhaps new possibilities would be even better. Um, so, you know, I disagree. I don't think that we should... Well, she doesn't say that we shouldn't allow new possibilities, but I think that she's saying actually that um, new possibilities, just because they're new, shouldn't be inscribed with a certain uh, potential or kind of appreciated in a way that the already exist existing ones shouldn't be. But yeah, so that's, that's it. Um, for those that listened, thank you. And if you have any problems, you know how to leave it. But on that note, 